Hey guys, my name is Green Man. I'm originally from a small village in Germany. Uh, I was voted greenest person on the planet in 2008 and my passion is to inspire people to live a green lifestyle. I myself try to live as green as possible. Electricity bill less than 10 US dollars. I just created my carbon footprint, zero carbon footprint off-grid home. Green living, that's my business. In the morning, we look at our personal lives. In the afternoon, we look at what can we do in the office? What can we do as a member of an organization or as a manager or owner to take our organization, our business to the next level? Again, to shift from burden to planet to healing the planet through product innovation, energy efficiency, reduction of consumption, adding more to the bottom line and coming up with innovations that help the planet. That's what green living and working is all about, to look at where can I be the change and be the difference. Hello, good evening everybody. I hope you're doing great today. Uh, as usual, every two weeks, Saturday evening at 8 p.m. We got uh, Green Man on the show, hopefully some inspiration. I've always got a guest with me and tonight i've got the amazing bea dolores with me i first met bea a couple of years ago after a climate reality training and i am so inspired by her she's the ninang as well of my baby daughter uh kim kuya kim please bring bea on uh welcome to bea great to have you here with us hi bea how are you good evening uh, i'm great tomorrow's gonna be valentine's <laughs> Oh yeah, wow. Birthday. Any tips for an eco-friendly Valentine's? Oh yeah, just give some plant a a, a plant of roses would be great. Um, or if not, if you're just really going for the bouquet, please don't use any single-use plastics. Try to recycle. Try to um, come on, paper crafts are much more romantic because it's full of effort and it's well thought of. So try those other things. So you got to make the flowers yourself rather than buy them somewhere. The because if you buy them, they're usually wrapped in single-use plastic, right? Yeah. I'm not sure now if maybe we can check Dangwa or whatsoever if there are less plastic, single-use plastics nowadays, if maybe the... It's maybe the market is now um, changing things up. Just like, actually, there's already a lot of bouquets bought in that dangwa, wherein you will only, you can buy um, just, just vegetable bouquets. It's wow, wow. So if there are any admirers of Bea who would like <laughs> to um, kind of uh, send a signal tomorrow, make sure it's super sustainable guys otherwise one you, time you will be out already you will be rejected already right definitely <laughs> so these are the modern uh, eco-conscious sustainable climate emergency female champions that are the real change the real deal so this is amazing Bea, when did we first meet? Remind me, it was uh, in a coffee shop somewhere, right? In uh, October. Metro Manila. October 2016, maybe it's either Starbucks of Mega Mall or the one beside it. So I'm not sure. I'm sorry for... Anyway, we already spit the name, but I worked there before, so... Yes, yes, yes. So and you about got five in... years. Yes, yes, and you got in touch with me, right? You wanted to discuss a couple of ideas on sustainability and stuff like that and i gave you a copy of my book is that right and uh, yeah that's how we stayed in touch yeah great great and uh, bea became the yeah the the ninang of my baby daughter yeah. so uh it was uh amazing it's amazing right how things develop mm -hmm. so hi as well to our uh, friends from the scouts some of them are joining us tonight as well we have there the Amateur Media Association of the Philippine Scouts. Yes, great to see you guys here. Um, and uh, lovely to have you with us. Uh, I hope 
we will have the scouts from different parts of the Philippines as well joining us. Uh, they are our avid followers, uh, um, oh, and this okay. is great. Uh, so, guys, as you uh, come online, let us know where you are coming from tonight, which part of the country uh, you are from. Bea, where are you at the moment? I'm in Calamba, Laguna, the hometown of Dr. Na Dr. Jose Rizal, and we are quite close by. Yes, yes, yes. I'm in San Pablo, San Pablo City, so we are not so far away from one another at mm -hmm. the end of the day. And uh, what have you been up to the last few days? Um, I'm actually trying martial arts. Um, I've had some growing fascinations with it. At the same time, I'm, I've already accessorized my BAM bike. So I work in BAM bikes. So I'm also an ambassador. And then now I'm going to try to go out of the subdivision to really try the road, the main roads. And actually, I'll, I'll bring the bike to Manila tomorrow. All right. That's great. So uh, what is sustainable about the BAM bike? I mean, uh, a lot of people here might have never heard of it. Um, oh. What is it actually about and what made you become an ambassador? Yeah, um, the BAM bike is um, created by BAM, by Brian McClelland. Of, um, hmm. He used to work in Gawad Kalinga, if you're familiar with the sustainable and um, those who help those who are who, those who are um, in low-income families to, to have their own houses. And then the, in Gawad Kalinga, especially in the Tarlac area, they also help in providing livelihoods. And then that's where Brian came in. He was an intern and all. And eventually he, he just became fascinated with bamboo to the point that he was able to create some bamboo frames and then eventually mm -hmm. they really um, harnessed the technology of bamboo and they were able to create a bamboo bike. And mm -hmm. excellent. Uh, the, the experience uh, of bamboo bikes are really, um, really amazing. It's shock absorbing. That's why it's mm -hmm. much more comfortable in riding bamboo bikes compared to the usual ones, as well as you can see that there is higher tensile strength in bamboos, in engineered bamboos compared to steel. Wow, this is all great. This is the eco-friendly material that grows super fast, absorbs a lot of carbon when it grows, and you chop it, it regrows. So it's wonderful, it's amazing. Actually, Brian promised me as well uh, a baby bike for my daughter one oh. day. So tell him I haven't forgotten that. And oh, yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> we're, we're looking forward to that one day. And we have Mika here, all the way from Negros Occidental. Hi, Mika. We have Sharm here, wonderful Sharm, the host of the uh, other podcast that I was on. She's from Batangas, Philippines. She's from the uh, Scouts, uh, Boy Scouts TV. And Kat, we have Kat here. Actually, you might have met Kat before, Bea, because he is a very well-known uh, uh, green architect that is very... Uh, experience in LEED and green building certification. Oh. So um, he might ask one or two questions for you later on because Bea is uh, studied architecture as well. So we have uh, uh, Vanessa as well, all the way from uh, Muntin Lupa. That's great. We have different parts of the Philippines here joining us tonight. That's wonderful. And Bea, what made you become uh, a climate? emergency climate action champion i mean where did it all start um mainly it started with my mother because she is really a green thumb although i'm not good with guarding myself i try but overall i was raised to really live eco-friendly we we live we don't waste at all and we also keep our plastics and we segregate properly and all that. We, we really live a very humble life. And then mm. in architecture, um, at first it was all um, 
sometimes you see archi- people see architecture like as like a destructive industry but then i'm thankful that we were taught better that we were taught that architecture should be des- in designing for the people designing for the environment and not for profit only and so- i'm thankful that my professor um shared with us the un- inconvenient truth of Al Gore. Wow. So we watched that. That's actually my main um, turning point. From then on, I I started becoming more um, intuitive with what I do. And then 2016 came the training. And, if, and since then, I just started becoming more active and be really out there for the environment. Wow. That's great. That's amazing. It was the professor at the university that shared the uh, Al Gore movie. Amazing. And it provided additional inspiration. Now, if we want to build a small house in the Philippines, can you make us a design of a eco-friendly, sustainable uh, small house? Are you yes. already? Yeah. Uh, but are you asking for like a prototype or like a ready design or if I'm capable? <laughs> no, I mean, we, we want to do a, a small one in the in the province ah. in uh, uh, um, in Quezon province, just a small one, but it's supposed to be green. We want, you know, the, the, the cooling to be as effective as possible. So the natural roofing material, the right positioning so that the sun doesn't heat it up before we go to bed at night so that hopefully it will be comfortable without the aircon to use. I mean, we have already a mini Baha'i Kubo there, um, but this is supposed to be a little bit bigger, uh, more solid than the Baha'i Kubo, Mm -hmm. but still green, sustainable, low cost and eco-friendly. So um, can you help us with that? Can you help our listeners with that? Of course. Um, we're actually starting right now with my friend, art an architect, and that there's this very lovely client of ours that really wants an all natural house. And so yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy that there are um clients like that who are really passionate that that we really are going to make the most out of not using any steel and all mm. so wish us luck and uh, actually here at home i actually i also don't need any elect um uh, not uh electrical ventilation because it's just well situated and really the tropical design is my thing that's that's what i live for and i'm all into of course i'm already in the bamboo advocacy as mm. well um I'm really into integrating the natural materials into the modern ways. Ways, great. So we we have, life. yeah, we have Victor here asking, can it be done with a specific budget? So that that's one thing, uh, you know. And I have a budget in mind, and I want. I'm gonna look forward to hear what budget you are gonna give us. Mm-hmm. And what do we do if the materials and the way of doing things that you suggest is uh, complicated for the uh, workers in the barangay who are used to uh, the hollow uh, uh, blocks and the cement and you're going to tell them you can do it all with natural materials and hi Jean Gabriel who is watching from Pampanga that's great to see you here so what budget do we need and how can we make it easy for the workers Mm -hmm. actually the client personally gave them their own budget. And then personally, we're still about to explore the in terms of budget wise and also in terms of the people, because right now we are already seeing the technology on how things can be done. And then it's can it can be also discussed with those who will work with us. Um, it also depends on the interest of those people and then the willingness of them to learn. But all in all, it can be done. And then, yeah, in terms of budget wise, I'm not sure if I can give something very concretely. I really want to do more research about it. Okay, so next time when Bea comes on the show, she will give us the detailed budget with the proposal of what we can use and how we can train the workers in the barangays 
to cope with the natural material and Victor as well is worried that the insects are going to come in. Yeah. You know, if you have an open system, you will be eaten up by the insects, right, Victor? There are What's solutions. Your view on that? There are <laughs> there solutions. Are solutions as well as actually that was also the case before, like from Spanish colonial period. They also already had their solutions on how to eradicate some stuff, what antibacterial solutions should be done so that things won't be um, contaminated and whatsoever. So it's really based on the designs. And in terms of lessening the budget, it's more of if there are already available site, um, materials on site, for example, the trees there, um, and then if there are really just materials close by, things will be a whole lot cheaper. All right, good. So let's go back to basics for tonight. We want to talk as well about the climate emergency. Now, do we have a climate emergency? Some people say, hey, what's the problem? You know, I don't see any emergency around me. What, what would you say to that? Mm -hmm. um, I hope that last year's scenario in the Philippines, the endless donation drives, and it's very, very exhausting, already made us realize that there is some climate emergency. Um, there's been a lot of tragedies that happened here in the Philippines itself. We already had just six storms in a month, and about a lot of them were devastating. It cost us billions of pesos and a lot of lives lost, of course. So that's already an emergency itself. Um, things are so out of hand already. And yeah. Would you say COVID is as well part of that emergency? I mean, is COVID linked to climate change, Bea? I cannot, I'm, I don't want to say the climate. I can say that it's more of a biodiversity issue and then a man-made issue as well that because of the tam tampering of humans in the environment, that's what led to COVID. Um, climate change might have worsened it, but I, I don't want to delve into that portion because it's mm. much more scientific. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a complex topic, but I think the essence that you mentioned there is a question about the relationship of the human species with the natural environment and the extraction of 7 billion humans, consumption and endless growth, extracting all the uh, oil, gas, coal that Mother Nature took millions of years to accumulate in the crust of the earth. We are digging it out, burning it and fueling our economic growth within a short period of time of human civilization. And we are disconnecting with the balance of the biodiversity. Those things all work together and accumulate more and more risks endangering the human species presence on planet Earth. That would be my take on it. But yes, it's so complex in terms of the relationships that we cannot make a simple conclusion here. But uh, there are things that give us the clear message. We need to take action. We humans need to take action. So for all of our listeners out there, and uh, I have as well this one comment from Victor, and I think we should do another session, another time on uh, um, green buildings and affordable houses. Maybe Kat, who joined us as well, he could be one of the guests. And we can really talk about that as a separate topic. But um, what can um, the youth in the Philippines do, Bea, to address the climate emergency? And we will come as well back to the other question from Victor that's linked to the topic. So what actions can we actually take here and now? Mainly for the youth to really speak and, of course, bring awareness to their own fellow um, friends, peers, because we have a lot of power and we are the ones who are you have the means and resources to learn, to um, to spread more awareness. And at the same time, we are also the ones who are currently learning things. And basically, we are the ones who can choose the lives that we're heading to. Like if we want to pursue architecture, if we want to pursue sustainable development, please, mm. it's, it's the time for us. You can choose the 
much more sustainable path, which will eventually make you become the fr frontliners of this development, especially in the future. You will become the future leaders of this, and as well as hmm, make it's kind of an anxiety of the of the youth that what is the future that we are going to face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can help. Yeah, you can help shape the future rather than being uh, caught by the anxiety, driven mm -hmm. in a corner. Uh, you can challenge the people who make the decisions that will affect the future of the youth. So it's basically an empowerment, right? An empowerment to step up, let your voice to be heard, uh, take action, mm -hmm. and articulate. Now. Yeah. Uh, you were the Filipino representative to the mock COP. Now, COP is Conference of Parties. This is the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, process to come up with a solution to the problem. You might have heard of the Paris Agreement. That was basically a deal struck that's supposed to help globally all parties to avoid that the planet heats up more than 1.5 Celsius. The good news is Biden has made the US join again the Paris Agreement. I think we will see more impetus. You guys, you young people held a mock COP and you were the main Filipino representative. I'm very proud of you about that. What <laughs> did you guys come up with as the recommendations? Yes, um, so there are about 300 youth the uh, youth delegates from all over the world from 140 countries so imagine um there are 140 country representatives who discussed what they wanted for their own country and what they aim for the future and together they presented some suggested policies which eventually became uh an actual treaty in mock cop is it okay to share it here i wonder if we can you can pub, uh, show that in the in the show later, but yeah, you can also just check mockcop.org/treaty and compared. So what we can see as a main difference from this one, from the youth-led mockcop compared to the United Nations Conference of Parties, is that this one is made out of pure, genuine interest for sustainable change, and it's inclusive. It made sure that the those who are in this um, global south are heard and they have better representations there are actually about five delegates at global south countries compared to three delegates in other countries so there's this much availability of being heard as those who are actually experiencing the climate emergency so just imagine, you, you know, you can be heard at a global level. You can come from, uh, you know, a normal town in Laguna and, uh, you know, grow up in a, a simple barangay, right? And you can become a global voice. Same with me. I grew up in a small German village, barangay. Uh, that nobody took serious because <laughs> that village was like far away from anything else. And uh, everybody thinks, you know, there are only farmers and, and construction workers from that village. It doesn't really matter. The world is open. You can become a voice. If any one of you actually has a question for uh, Bea, feel free to share that in the um, chat section. We have actually, Victor, asked that question, uh, should our government consider the UN SEC general call to declare climate emergency? I think that's happened already in the Philippines. And mm -hmm. uh, he is as well commenting that we can join with Avant Wood. That's a Finnish company that turns uh, bamboo and other materials into high-performance building materials. So I, I think that's what Vic is referring to. But... Um, this climate emergency declaration that happened already, Bea, right? And what does it actually mean? Mm -hmm. um, basically, so right now we are already um, providing our own national determined contributions. And also, um, it also followed that 
declaration of climate emergency. So basically, all nations should take things seriously right now, as well as corporations. Corporations have a lot of say and control over what are happening and over the carbon emissions as well. So for these uh, NDCs, tell us what exactly is that? And uh, how ambitious is the Philippines going to be? I know we had this controversy some years ago, I think, where the president made the comment that, you know, this might be too tough for the country. But I think people have realized these are voluntary uh, goals that a country can set by itself. A country is not forced to accept goals given by someone else. So where are we with regards to the local Philippines nationally determined contribution process and most likely targets to be achieved? We are actually just started to revise the text that was already drafted before about last year. Um, thankfully, um, there were a lot of consultations that happened among the civil society organizations. So the civil society organizations were heard by our own government and we really saw the drastic improvement on the NDC that is now going to be sent and um, uh, submitted to the United Nations. And actually it was just sent earlier this morning at us, those who were there as stakeholders and those who were consulted and heard of, and I can see the drastic change. And I'm, I'm really happy about it. Uh, they said that they aim for inclusive growth, that there will be a meaningful participation for everyone, as in not just the youth, not just the civil society organizations, but also the indigenous peoples, and as well as the PWDs and basically really everyone. And um, basically, it's all about the sustainable development that we want as a country. And in terms of the conditional or the unconditional matters, there will be about 75% carbon reduction targets by 2030. That is going to be the commitment of the Philippines. Wow, that's great. That's great. This is 75% of carbon intensity or how it is defined? Because some people have talked about total carbon emission reduction. Uh, others have talked about carbon intensity, which is CO2 emission in relation to GDP, or it could be like CO2 emission in relation to population. So what is that 75% referring to? Hmm what they said at the moment, because of course, texts are limited, the papers are limited. So right now what they mentioned is carbon reduction targets, but maybe I could ask that to them personally about um, the elaborated process. And also later on, they will provide us an in implementation plan and whatnot, a timetable. And so we will really um, watch over what they are talking about and what they want us to know and for us to actually provide our insights. We can we can go ahead and look at the Climate Change Commission Facebook page. Sometimes they give announcements there on um, and they and they make the the consultations live on Facebook. So you can listen yeah. and you can watch or provide some comments there. Yeah, it's actually the Facebook page of the Climate Change Commission. Uh, you can search for them. They are doing uh, the live uh, uh, screening of the consultations. You can actually watch the one that happened one and a half weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And um, before we go to the uh, two questions here that Victor is asking, what about the scouts? We have some scouts here uh, listening uh, today. If they wanted to get involved, because I was amazed when I was on their show on Thursday, which I can highly recommend, they were saying that they are going to plant, I can't remember, one million or two million trees, the Boy Scouts, oh. uh, which is incredible. And um, how can that contribute to the targets? How can the Scouts get involved in the national NDC implementation and consultation? Did you mention native trees or you just mentioned trees? 
you have to ask them what kind of trees they uh, plan to plant. So, um, but that question already implies, hey guys, uh, Bea would love you to plant native trees rather than foreign species, right? Mm -hmm. For getting the biodiversity aspects, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, of course, a uh, forest tree is also part of the NDC or of our nationally determined contributions that we need to really take care of our ec ecological um, resources so that we can definitely reduce the carbon emissions. And planting trees is a great help. And for my own suggestion is to really reach out to DENR, to that place, to that city to that site where you're going to plant so that you will know the actual species that will thrive there and be healthy for that environment. Yeah, and uh, Victor here is basically saying, okay, you know, CO2 emissions, the plastic is made from oil uh, and we are creating so much plastic waste. Isn't that 75% figure and economic conditions too ambitious? And then another uh, add-on to that, uh problems with transport and car emissions i guess you know if we look at most of the vehicles here they seem to be releasing more emissions than the law stipulates they should but somehow they still get a certificate so what do we do about all of that and how can we address that to help us achieve those ambitious targets i mean firstly i am not a representative of the government it's just that I had the opportunity to be in touch with what's with their updates so I can say something about it. Um, firstly, about the plastics, I just saw from the Climate Change Commission that they are pushing through um, completely eradicating single-use plastics. You can check it out. It's just one of the recent posts of Climate Change Commissions. I personally don't know how they will do it, but at least there's this initiative to really try to implement it. And then in regards to the transportation, that's my same concern <laughs> that, hmm, what is happening? Um, can, um, I actually asked that on the NDC consultation that did they include the computation on the rise of the vehicles regarding the, um, of course, there were a lot of roads being constructed as well. So is this going to contradict one another with their with their um, NDC? So hmm, we are here to watch over and we are here to really just make uh, the government stick to their commitments. But I think what is very, very important is that this is a collaboration between government and uh, the various okay. parties in the country. Uh, yeah. It doesn't work with having, you know, okay, you are the guys who have to implement it and we are going to watch you and we are going to step on your toes. All mm -hmm. stakeholders need to collaborate. All stakeholders need to come together for a common goal, a common ambition. The Philippines is a relatively small contributor to the global climate change problem, but it's hit very hard by being one of the countries most at risk. So we all need to start with ourselves, with our own carbon footprint, and seek for collaboration rather than confrontation, I think. in, in yeah. So, you know, I, I see a lot of people asking for this, asking for that, but there needs to be a good spirit of collaboration to be able to achieve it and get the benefits from achieving it. The perception is usually if we do all of this, it will cost an arm and a leg, but actually it might lead to a healthier society, to more sustainable agriculture, to a more uh, healthy biodiversity and uh, to lifting up the income, especially at a rural level, if we go through sustainable transformation and innovation. And if you clean up the air, both outside and inside, you usually have a healthier life and a more productive workforce. So there are all these benefits that we can gain. And I think even recently, again, there was a study made that the money we would have to spend to reverse climate change is actually very, very small compared to what we are spending on COVID now, and the benefits are gigantic. So um, 
the Green New Deal that people are talking about in the US, in Europe. We have a law here in the Philippines on green jobs, which is amazing. Actually, the Philippines government has been very proactive in many ways. But I think we need everybody to work together on making it happen in in real life, in, in practical terms. How can we accelerate that, that spirit of collaboration? Yeah, um, hopefully it would it would definitely need a whole lot of teams involved, like for example, active participations of CSO, civil society organizations. Also, um, hopefully there are business owners here or are listening. We um, the government would definitely need your help in terms of try to make your own business sustainable, as well as, of course, the building professionals, all sectors would really need to step up and also reach out to the government to provide some help, especially the research, the researchers and the academes, all of us can do something about it. So practically speaking, Bea, for the business people, what is your recommendation for business people how to green their business, make it more sustainable, make it more socially equitable? Um, I think, Matthias, it's more of your realm. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's, it's because there's like a lot of, I'm not a technical person in terms of the businesses, so I don't know. Um, for me, it's just more of, um, Take, take things into heart that what you're doing is for the environment and for the people. And if you are doing something that is good for the benefit of many, um, you will be blessed as well as people will support you more because you are doing uh, something that is for a good cause. And so, so therefore there's a whole bunch of layer added on your business and that's gonna make you unique and that's gonna make you um, much more attractive to your target market. Great, that's excellent. In the same way as those who want to charm Bea tomorrow with a Valentine's <laughs> gift, they have to be sustainable, otherwise they will face outright rejection. <gasps> so this is the same message for the business people out there. Uh, consumers will reject you unless you uh, become more sustainable. The millennials and the consumers of the future will use a different measuring stick. They will not just buy the, the cheapest and the single use, as Victor said, no plastic for Valentine's. Don't do plastic, otherwise you'll be in big trouble. Just <laughs> imagine if all the ladies of the world would reject plastic for Valentine's, boom, what impact would that make? <laughs> <laughs> Any other suggestions uh, from our audience on eco-friendly Valentine's gifts? I always tell my wife, darling, you know, I'm sustainable. I believe in dematerialization. That's why I don't have a physical gift for you. My gift is the gift of love, heart, and emotion, and time spent with you. Then there is no waste, right? It's the experience. And yeah. I shared something as well uh, with um, the uh, friends from the Scouts on the uh, show we had on Thursday, which I think they enjoyed a lot. Instead of uh, FOMO, we need JOMO. What is Do that? you know what is JOMO, Bea? Is FOMO fear of missing out? Yeah, FOMO is fear of missing out. Joy of and missing jo out. Hmm? Joy of missing out? Yes. JOMO That's is the joy of missing out. There, there is so much joy in not needing to do this, not needing to have this, not being under pressure to go into Lazada and look for the latest something. I don't there even is... go online. I don't hmm? even go to Lazada. I know. I'm just talking in general terms. I, I, I just want to share that I am surprised that I haven't online shopped in Lazada or in any online shops for so long. 
I buy from my wow. friends um, books. Second just hand. That I make sure, yeah, and I make sure that um, I lessen the carbon emissions. And for example, if I can meet them, it's going to be um, much more less carbon emissions for me because I was able to do a lot of other things as well as I'll just meet them because I live outside Metro Manila. So it's going to be extra carbon emissions. So that's a no-no for me. So what about the clothes that you're wearing? Are they recycled? This is from my sister. A majority of my clothes are hand-me-downs. So, yeah. Great. I mean, this one is not... It's not handed down from anyone else, but this shirt I've worn it maybe four or five hundred times. Yeah, so I know. It's definitely eco efficient. <laughs> hundred times. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, the shift from FOMO to JOMO and life will be more cost effective. You will have a lower carbon footprint and you will have more happiness. So that could yeah. be as well a climate emergency strategy, right? Jomo yeah. instead of FOMO. So uh, as we are wrapping up, Bea, what are your words of wisdom for your fellow country women and country men, the, the young generation in the Philippines? How can they contribute to addressing the climate emergency and doing that in a way that doesn't scare them off? but take them to uh, another level of fulfillment and happiness. Mm -hmm. Since this is Valentine's and um, we are also just, this is also something that I always say that the main solution to address the climate emergency and also to help mother earth is to love, love mother earth, um, learn to love it much deeper so that, as in just appreciate what's around you, um, appreciate the leaves, appreciate the trees, appreciate what you're smelling, the wind, the sun, appreciate everything about nature so that you will be really drawn in actually doing something for the environment. Just love, love Mother Earth. Wow, beautiful words of wisdom. That's a fitting end to our show today Bea Dolores climate reality leader and champion for so many good causes thanks for joining us today take that love for nature and for your fellow humans with you uh, today tomorrow and uh, all days make uh, that eco valentines every day like earth day every day cheers see you again in two weeks time thanks so much Bea Bye-bye. I hope for a sustainable Philippines to get to the point where we ensure ecological integrity, clean and healthy environment, where we expand economic opportunities in agriculture, fishery and forestry, and when we ensure a people-centered, clean and Efficient governance. I think this is how I envision sustainable Philippines. Hello, I am Mocario SD1, an undergraduate student of De La Salle University, Manila. And I envision a sustainable Philippines where every Filipino is responsible enough to take a stand and to take action on the current state and the future fate of our country, particularly the environment and its people. I envision a sustainable Philippines where every Filipino is walking on the same path and working on the same goal, to nourish the environment and make this world a better place, not just for our own generation, but more especially for the generations to come. A nation that is willing to work with nature to create a brighter future. A sustainable Philippines is when every Filipino works for the good of the country, economically, socially, and environmentally, making it a better place to live in forever. A sustainable Philippines will mean self-sufficiency in food, clean energy, and clean potable water everywhere. Plastic production, usage, and disposal will be better handled. Pollution will be at levels that do not adversely affect the health of people, animals, and plants. Lastly, 
the government will truly be focused on the needs of the people in all respects so that there is less waste in fuel, time, and health. I would like to see sustainable pH catalyze a movement of responsible stewards who conserve and preserve the rich natural resources of the Philippines so that every Filipino can have access to basic human needs of food, clothing, and shelter. So that every Filipino can have an equal opportunity to thrive and flourish in his own country because we are Sustainable PH. My future vision for a sustainable Philippines is that we can create loads of new jobs and a great economy from healing the planet and the opportunity for our children to breathe clean air, have clean and fresh water and harmony with nature. I hope for a sustainable Philippines where everyone can have access to basic services like quality education and health care and also um, enjoy a clean air and environment, live in sustainable cities and have decent jobs and be protected by justice.